Okay, from the text, from the text of 1 Corinthians 15, we have Paul writing to this church in Corinth around 55, 57 A.D., about 20-some years after the actual passion took place. 20, 25 years, okay? So that's quite a while after the passion, after the death, burial, and resurrection took place. So the question that I have is that we're looking back 2,000 years, and how in the world does the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a baby, oh my gosh, a baby, I love it. Is that a baby? Good. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. That's what weddings do, you know? In fact, moving right along with that story, is that every single one of us sitting in the pew or standing up here right now came because of something that took place in the past. My mother and father met each other. They fell in love. They got married. And they had a baby. That is true for every single individual in this room, as well as everyone around the globe. So the impact of others' lives, even before us, produced who we are. So when we look at Paul writing 20 years or so, remember he said, he appeared to Cephas, Peter first, then to the 12, and then to like 500 people, and then least of all, in an untimely way, he appeared to me. 20, 25 years later, how does the resurrection of Jesus Christ impact my life today? How does it impact your life today? Today. So that's what we're going to dig into a bit, okay, in the Easter effect. So I want to define effect through the dictionary, and it's basically an effect is that which is produced by the action of an agent and follows it in time, just like you and I were born. Took place because of our mom and dad. So Christ was raised from the dead, and 20, 25 years later, Paul is talking about, remember this gospel, remember this good news, Remember that it's for, oh my gosh, what did the angels say to the shepherds? Today, today is born a Savior. And this is good news for the whole world. And what did the shepherds say? Let's go see. What a basic concept. We had a baby. Did your parents want to come see your baby? Of course they did. This is good news, folks. Christ raised from the dead. 20 years later, Paul is still talking about it. Okay. So, about 100 years ago, Forsyth wrote. And he wrote something very important for us to, um, it's just a, a short quote that I'm going to read. But it has to do with how this effect comes to me personally, individually. How it comes to you personally, individually. As though it is from another person. Oh my goodness gracious. What does that look like? He wrote. This treasure does not come to us, to me, to you, as if we were blank paper, dead matter, or blind forces. It finds something to appeal to, to stir, to evoke in you, in me. As I wrote in the um, first page of the bulletin, 
that for me, it was when I was 19 years old, and I was living in a small Christian community out of college, and had, was clueless about the Christian faith, about church, about the Bible, about everything. But they were way different than I was, way different. And there is one gal that always stands out in my, in my mind, and that is Carol McRae. And she had a smile on her face that never went away. She had joy in her heart that never went away. It didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, sleeting, icing, whatever. Didn't matter. I had never experienced another human being like her or like tons of others. So one night after living with them for a few months, I just said, God, if you're who they say you are, I want to know you. I know, have no clue, but I just reached out to him because something was touching my heart, and it was them. It was them. Just like Paul touched all of those people in Corinth. Just like an individual, and more than one individual, touched my life. The Easter effect. So let's three, three images, all right? Living water, living water. You remember the story of the woman at the well, and Jesus comes to her, and she is like, I don't get this at all. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You are not supposed to be communicating with me at all. Why? Why are you talking with me? Oh, you personally love her? Really? Do you personally love me, God? Do you personally love every single one in this room, God? Do you? How far does your love go? How far does it reach? How many people can it touch in real ways that comes into that evocative area of our lives and go, oh my goodness gracious, I don't know exactly what's happening here, but it's good. It is good. So the woman at the well has all of these questions and all these frustrations going, I have no clue what you're talking about. And he tells her, the water I give is living water. You will never thirst again. And she jumps on that and says, I'll take some. I'll take some. I don't want to come to this well every day. It's a long way from the village. I want that living water. What does she do after being touched by Jesus? She goes back to the town and says, you guys listen to me for a second. He said everything I've done in my past, and he still loved me. He still accepted me. Is this not the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for, and he came to me? And the whole town, it says, went out to see what she had said, if it's true. Hmm, the Easter effect, living water. The next image, treasure, treasure. And that comes from, from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where he says something to the effect of this treasure, this treasure, this, this life that God gives through the gospel this treasure is in our bodies as jars of clay to show that the surpassing power is not of us, not the jar of clay, but the treasure within, within our heart. Remember our whole series on what's new after New Year's? A new heart I will give you. A new creation you will become. A new song I will put in your heart and in your myth, mouth and on your lips. Everything is going to be new. Treasure, treasure. So here's Paul. How in the world did it happen in his life where he came to grips with this treasure? It was when he was Saul, and he was an unbelievably religious man and believed in the Old Testament scriptures and had a relationship with the living God that he would give everything and do everything he could to further the Israel nation forward under God. To the point of stamping out this crazy sect that some people say the Messiah has come. 
So that's what he did until that interesting trip to Damascus where a light blinded him. He fell face down on the dirt in the roadway and cried out, Who are you, Lord? Who are you? And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Isn't it interesting? Even the first person that saw Christ after he rose from the grave was Mary, a female. She was in the garden weeping, looking for the body of Jesus to put incense and herbs and whatnot on the body to mourn. And she did not recognize and thought it was the gardener until when? Until what happened? Until Jesus spoke her name, Mary. And she knew in a moment, it's my Lord. He is alive. Isn't it interesting that he calls our name? He knows you by your name. He knows me by my name. Did Jesus not say, hey, hey, disciples, didn't I call you by name to come follow me? That's how he comes. That's how he has come since day one. So there's two words in business that are critically important. One is sustainability. The other is scalability. Can we sustain this business? Is it scalable? Can it grow? I don't know of one other institution on this planet that has scalable to the point of 2,000 years, over 2,100 different cultures and languages that it has produced, reproduced itself. That's scalability. That's sustainability. There are more Christ followers today than ever there have been on planet Earth. That's covering 2,000 years of human history. Treasure. Lastly, life. So John's gospel. We're going to find out a lot of stuff when we, uh, when we see him face to face. And one is, who actually did write John and when, when was it written? A lot of scholars think it's in the 80, 90. So we're looking at 50 years after. Do you realize that the Gospel of John is the most intimate, closely connected with human beings, with the writer, the author, or the group that he was a part of, out of all four Gospels, that the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar, coming from different perspectives about Jesus Christ historically, where John comes at it from a completely different He comes personally with deep, rich language. He concludes with this. Fifty-some-odd years after the Passion took place, here's this group of believers, don't know exactly where, that are together, sustaining each other by the life that has been given to them. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So it all boils down to life. That is a powerful, powerful word that meets you and myself 
this morning and every single day when we wake up. It is this life that Scripture talks about. It is living water. You will never have deep, deep sorrows and longings again in the sense of, oh my gosh, I don't know where to go. You'll always know where to go. When you drink this water, you will know where to go and who to go to. This treasure, life is a treasure. Every day brings newness, brings wonder, brings delight, brings adventure, a new baby. Praise God. A new life, treasure, and it brings life, abundant life. Whenever we have a funeral in this room, we talk about the hope of everlasting life. We talk about the effect of Easter, that that in and of itself gives us hope that there is eternal life, that it is real. My prayer is that this morning you have tasted and seen that this resurrection is true, is life, and it brings life to anyone who reaches out for it. And that's my prayer for you.